Good morning. Everyone wonder why are you looking at us? I'm counting. I was sitting on the bus this morning and I was thinking, I'm, I'm very curious about how many male and how many female who are going to listen today. Are there only going to be females interested in, interested in this topic? But I'm glad to see it's not. Not really 50-50, but also a good mix. Great to be here, uh, to see you all live. Some of you we saw when the restrictions were not too strict this, uh, this autumn, but now we hope to be back the whole spring, don't we? Yes, good. So today's topic, why are more men involved in entrepreneurship than women? Very interesting, and I think you're going to give us some answers on of that, Dr. Sally Jones. Uh, you're here visiting Chalmers and working with the Jenny project right now. And uh, I think you have learned some about Chalmers. Uh, Jenny Project is a project that, um, uh, with a goal to get more female making career at Chalmers, actually. And um, you are also associate professor in, in entrepreneurship and gender studies at Manchester M Metropolitan University Business School. That short name. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you're also co-founder and chair of the Gender and Enterprise Network, Jen. I think we're going to hear some about that, maybe. So we're really interested to get the answer of this huge question, aren't we? Good. And you're going to have about 25 minutes. And after that, we open up for questions for all of you who want to. OK. Warmly welcome, Dr. Sally Jones. An applaud. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for coming along to my presentation. And thank you very much to uh, eVillage for inviting me to come and talk about this topic. Um, I was, it was suggested that I talk about this. And it seems like a, a, a very straightforward question, really. But when I started to put the slides together, I thought, hmm, hang on a minute. I, I, I developed a, an undergraduate 10-week course that looked at this topic. So trying to condense everything into a 25-minute talk has been very difficult. So I'm taking quite a broad view of things, and it's almost like an introduction to get you to start thinking and maybe give you some references. You can go and have a look and do some more reading if you're interested. So I'm a reader, associate professor in entrepreneurship and gender studies. So how I think about things very much comes from a gender lens and thinking about things in a gender perspective. And I don't think it's controversial to, to suggest that um, societies have developed around the idea of, of a gender binary, that, that there are men and that there are women, and, and men do certain things and women do certain things. And in some ways, they're seen as being opposites. In fact, we talk about the opposite sex. Um, so over thousands of years, societies developed um, with particular ideas about expectations around what men and women might do. Um, and very often, they are seen as being quite different. And it has had some very practical implications uh, for men and women. Um, just thinking about up until the 1970s, women didn't have, um, they couldn't have independent finance, they couldn't open bank accounts, um, their, their fathers um, had to sign things off for them, and then when they got married, their husbands signed things off for them, they couldn't get mortgages. Um, and likewise with employment rights, um, in the UK we had the marriage bar, so as soon as you got married, um, you, you had to leave your job, um, because there was an expectation that then of course, your husband would be looking after you, so why would you need to have a job? So these ideas have quite a long, a long tail, and I think some of the, some of the institutions that, that are around us today um, were based on some of these ideas. They have a very long tail in some, in some respects. They still have some um, implications for us today. So I'm just flagging this up, because this, this is sort of a lens that, that um, I think about entrepreneurship and, and women and men's entrepreneurship through. Um, so thinking about um, globally um, entrepreneurship, men and women, this is from the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor and it's a really, really um, great report. It's done every year and this looks at um, entrepreneurial activity across the world. And as you can see from the slide um, where 
men are orange and women are blue, um, across the world there are fewer women that pursue entrepreneurial activity than men. Now, the, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor looks at different um, countries and it, and, it, and it classifies countries as um, lower income, middle income and high income. And we can see in the, the lower income countries that there's higher rates of entrepreneurial activity and there's also some cases where there are more, more women than men. Um, and when we look at the, the high income countries, there's a lot lower level rates of entrepreneurial activity across, across the board. Um, now, there's arguments, and I'll come back to this at the end, there's arguments around different types of entrepreneurship and why um, rates generally with men and women would be lower in higher income countries. And it's suggested this is around the type of entrepreneurship that's pursued. So there are arguments that in lower income countries, there's, there's less money that's put into infrastructure. So um, maybe education might not be offered for free. Health may not be offered for free. So there's less of a, a safety net for people. So, so in lower income countries, there's, there's more of a drive to generate an income. Um, and this is clusters, it's, it's called necessity entrepreneurship. So you, you, you have to find a way of, of generating an income. Um, whereas in higher income countries, we have more, we're very fortunate, we have more of um, a safety net. So, um, and we have access to good free education in some cases, healthcare. So that's part of the context as well. When we think about the national context for men and women as well and the conditions that, that people are in and that has an impact on relative levels of entrepreneurship. But um, on the whole, women don't pursue entrepreneurship as much as men. There are lower numbers involved. And there are several explanations for this. And I've put lack of because it, sometimes women are positioned as lacking. They lack confidence. They, they lack uh, motivation. They're risk averse. There's quite a lot of... Um, onus on sometimes things that, that women need to change about themselves. Um, and this is taking a psychological perspective. And that's when you're ben benchmarking men against women. And some people argue that that's not actually fair because um, there are different expectations linked to, to the, the, the gender binary as well. Um, so there are internal ideas, and this is coming from research and the, the first sort of research that was done around this was the sort of 1970s when women started to become um, more visible in the workplace and started to, to be involved in entrepreneurship in the US. And then there's external arguments um, around the way that entrepreneurship is presented more broadly in the media. So the people that we know, the people who come to mind when we think about entrepreneurs are generally men. They're generally white men. And we have this idea of who, what an entrepreneur look, look, looks like and who an entrepreneur is and the type of person they might be. So there's an argument that that has an impact. And this links back to gender roles, what's expected of society and of, from society of women, um, gender stereotypes that develop around that, um, issues around access to finance, and some people argue that's go, that goes back to this long tail of women um, not, not having control of their finances and not being able to access finance. And the gender pay gap, um, that's becoming more of an issue now and understanding that, that um, women um, often don't earn as much as men. So when you think about resourcing for a business, maybe they've got less access to their own personal finances as well. And then there's, uh, there's ideas around gender occupational segregation. And I'll talk a bit more about, about that. So one of the things that's talked about a lot is that it's suggested that women are risk averse. And I would argue that this is a bit of a stereotype. Um, it depends how you think about risk, really. And there was a study in 2015 um, of businesses, successful businesses, and they talked to the men and women who run those businesses. And that they, they suggested that th there's different ideas about what risk is and different sensitivity to risk. And the women in that study were quite happy to talk about themselves as risk takers. They were very happy that they could identify risks and they could mitigate for the risks. And um, what they also found was um, what they labelled as overconfidence in, in the men, in that they they 
they said their business was thriving and the women were less likely to say that. But when they looked at the profit, actually the women were making more profit. So, so maybe they were just a bit more realistic or they, they, they had higher expectations for themselves. I don't know, but it just, it just came out that it didn't quite match up with, with the objective reality of what, what their businesses were doing. So perhaps there's a different way of thinking about risk potentially. And again, that might come through, um, through, ideas of socialization and what risk is. Um, because when we're talking about sort of socialization when we're young and the way that, that girls and boys are sometimes, um, maybe girls are more protected and there's, there's different arguments about that and how much risk we would let our children put themselves into. So risk aversion is not necessarily, according to this research, something that um, women have. They have more of a sensitivity. They will see things as being a risk, and they will take mitigations to to um, to address that. So that's an internal idea they, that about confidence and about risk aversion or not. And then there are other ideas about the external implications. So, which I mentioned that people think could explain what's going on. So, another explanation is around uh, gendered education and subject choices. Um, and the latest figures I could find were from the OECD in 2017, and these do include Sweden. Um, they include about 17 different countries, and they found that um, women tend in tertiary education, so that's after school, um, and that's from degree to um, PhD, tend to be clustered in um, education, um, health and welfare. And when you think about education and health and welfare, if you're studying for an education degree or education qualification, there's an understanding that you're probably going to go into teaching. It's, it's a profession, it's a vocation. Likewise, with, with health and welfare, you're potentially studying to be a doctor or, or a nurse or, or a social worker. So again, there's a career path for you there. So why would, why would you think about um, setting up a business? You, you've chosen that with, with a particular career in mind. Um, and we can see that... that Fewer women are found in um, my glasses. Fewer women are found in electrical, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. But some women are studying those topics. So it's not that women aren't interested in those topics. It's 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 about the 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 choices that that they're making. And so people have, have researched well, why are, what, what, why are these choices being made? What what's happening here then? Because this is the pipeline to entrepreneurship. This is the pipeline to to a career. Are the choices that that um, that are made? So. Again, this, this idea of the gender binary and certain, certain jobs or roles being seen as uh, male or female or masculine or feminine. Um, there's arguments around teaching styles. But when you're choosing the topics you want to study, you're thinking about your future employment opportunities. So in some ways, you're thinking about where do people like me get jobs? Where do people like me fit in? How, where, what jobs can I see people doing that are like me and have my interests? Where will I belong? So... So people are making those choices, thinking about their future, and thinking about where they want to be in the future. And then the next step is going into the, going into the workplace. And obviously we have the pipeline from studying, which, which can funnel men and women into different, into different occupations. And then once men and women are in the workplace, there are arguments around um, they might potentially have different experiences and get access to different resources and be put into different roles and have different expectations. Um, and some of these are around, these are sort of six areas that, that, that I've sort of drawn out from the literature around some explanations for gendered occupational segregation. Um, and one of them is the pollution hypothesis that once um, something becomes seen as being feminized, then the pay um, goes down, like for example, teaching. Um, teaching, certainly in the UK, used to be male-dominated. And then when women were allowed to study, um, they were encouraged into teaching because that was seen as a, 
um, a suitable profession for women. Um, and as more women entered the profession, it became less attractive to men. And then, so there's sort of like this this hypothesis that 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 has an impact on the gender pay gap as well. And and also differential income roles, the understanding, the ideas around. Um, the, the, the male breadwinner, if you like, um, has a family to take care of, um, whereas the, the woman doesn't necessarily have to think about that. Although in the UK, the latest research I could find in 2020, 30% of households in the UK had, a, had a, a woman who was the main breadwinner. So there are ideas that have long, that have long tails that impact on, on how we think about the different roles of men and women, and this leads into um, entrepreneurship. Um, and if we think about the pathways to, to entrepreneurship, um, certainly in higher income countries, it would, it would not, I, I don't think um, governments would want to encourage um, lots of necessity entrepreneurship and I think if there was a lot of necessity entrepreneurship it might be seen as as almost a, a failure of government if people were feeling forced into entrepreneurship um, so so it's about certainly in higher income companies countries thinking about opportunity entrepreneurship and of course opportunity is about finding um, gaps in the marketplace finding ideas that are that are scalable that that are innovative and There's an argument that because of the different roles and expectations linked with women and the certain jobs that they do, they, they possibly lack the networks, they potentially lack the resources um, to identify opportunities and if they find opportunities to then go out and pursue them. However, in Sweden, women are more than eight times, this is according to the latest Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, more than eight times more likely than men to indicate offering innovative products and services. So, if you're, you're, and also you're sat here in the audience studying at Chalmers, um, you're in a really great position to be looking at opportunity entrepreneurship. Your, your choices have, have brought you here. So, you've got brilliant networks you can be developing, you've got um, brilliant colleagues and access to lots and lots of, of um, innovative spaces. So you're, you're the perfect candidate for opportunity entrepreneurship. And as I said, in Sweden, women are creating more innovative businesses. So, because it could be a bit doom and gloom otherwise. It could be, oh, it, you know, there's, there's um, but I think the context is important and I think where, you, where you're starting from and where you're coming from is important as well. And as I said, you are in the best position to be looking at opportunity entrepreneurship. So just some final, some final thoughts. Um, women's entrepreneurship patterns reflect generalized, feminized education, working and career patterns. And really entrepreneurship is a, a career choice. And so if you have um, a, a a job. If you, if you, if you, for example, go into teaching and you have you have good sickness benefits, you have good parental leave. Um, it, there's really got to be something that's pulling you towards entrepreneurship, and that is that that is that opportunity. Um, and statistics don't always capture the full range of women's entrepreneurship because they don't count. Very often, they don't count part time, and and often people start up men and women start up their businesses uh, part time. Um, as, as they're working. Um, and not all research agrees that men and women are different. There's the file draw phenomenon. If you don't find a difference, you don't publish it or it doesn't get published because it's like, well, there's no difference. What's the point? You didn't find out anything, did you? So, so studies are more likely to be published if they do find a difference, which perpetuates the idea that men and women are different, um, the gender binary. Um, Benchmarking women against men leads to ideas about deficiency. They lack this, they lack that, they lack, they lack the other. Um, but you need to look at things in the round. You need to look at the context. You need to think about the, 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 the bigger picture within that particular context. Um, and maybe we should value women's choices more. Maybe the, the roles that, that women do take on, maybe teaching, nursing, caring, maybe, we should, maybe they should be more valued. Um, and I'll leave on another positive note. Women-led bus women businesses are more profitable. Pearson did a study in 2016 across 91 countries and they found that, that women's businesses were more sustainable and they were more profitable. So it's not 
doom and gloom, and I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm just full of inspiration and, and, and information, but I open up for all of you. Do you have any questions for Sally Jones? <laughs>